ETH podcast, Plants on Mars, a journey through space and time with astrobiologist Grace Crane. So we're starting at a launch pad and we are shot up out of the Earth's atmosphere. And we're on our six-month journey to Mars, which is a long time. And it's never been done with humans before. This is the first journey to another planet within our solar system. My name is Grace Margaret Crane, and I am 26. Throughout this really journey to the planet, a lot of things will be happening with the crew. I mean, they'll be making sure daily that everything is in order. They will be exercising. They will be trying to get all of their vitamins and nutrients that they need. Hopefully, maybe some of those nutrients and food products would be coming from an alternative way to grow food. My father was always interested in astronomy, and he is kind of technically a space scientist in a way. Um, he's a physicist that focuses on weather patterns. And from a very young age, I was also always interested in his work and space weather and um, different phenomena happening in space. So not only planets and stars, constellations, black holes, all of these types of things was just really fascinating. And at the age of 10, I got my first telescope and we lived in the country in Texas. So we had big skies and we were really able to always look at up into the, to the sky and really wonder about what was going on. And so it, it was a dream of mine to be an astrobiologist, but that didn't really come until a little bit later. So I always had the love of space and the love of nature and these things. And then six months later, we arrive on the surface of Mars, which is not going to be easy either. Landing the actual space shuttle is very technical and computers and everything is connected back to Earth. So it's not easy, but it's not unheard of. We've landed several satellites on the surface of Mars, so this is the part of the journey that is familiar. At least in my mind it would be familiar. But the thing that would be the most difficult is how the humans react to landing on that surface of Mars. Going from Earth's gravity, from the no gravity and transport, to a different gravity of landing on the surface of Mars. So we're on Mars, it's dusty that we see, there's sand everywhere, but I can imagine that it's a beautiful desert landscape for the people that have been in a desert and know that looking out into a big sky or just looking out and seeing nothing for miles, it can feel lonely and it can feel isolating, but on one side it's also beautiful. This land is untouched. This land is new. It's unknown. I think that there's a big curiosity factor that would go into looking out on a landscape of Mars, being a human standing on that planet. So then being in the base, it would have everything from most likely a kitchen and a living room area, sleeping quarters, multiple greenhouses, hopefully what really the composition of, of the soil and the atmosphere, how do our bodies change over time being subject to these different environmental factors? Can we have a sustainable base in another world? These are all questions that are waiting to be answered by this first journey by a team of scientists that are extremely brave and people that are very brave because this is not going to be an easy journey or a safe journey, but an epic journey. And this is what we do as humans. We are curious and we want to explore and understand other worlds, if it's the moon, the bottom of the ocean, or Mars.
Here and now, back on Earth. I've been now in Switzerland since September of 2018. And I came here to work on my PhD with the ETH Zurich Group of Plant Nutrition on the Melissa Project, which is a European Space Agency funded project. And that's what I will continue to do for the next three years. So we are in a glass house that's located in Lindau, Switzerland. And when you look out of the glass house, you see farms. You can actually even see the Alps. You see grass, you see canola fields, you see trees. But then when you're coming into the greenhouse, it's a much different landscape. We have benches. It's really gray, but bright because we have a lot of growth lamps in here. And those growth lamps are helping the plants that we have in here grow. And those plants are soybean and something we call salicornia. And some of the sounds that we hear when we are in this greenhouse are actually mist coming from the top, which helps control the humidity of the greenhouse. And this faint air bubbles are actually giving oxygen to the plants that are in our hydroponic system. So I'm adjusting the the aeration to make sure that it's at a level necessary to provide the oxygen needed for the roots. Also, I need to fill up the water level for the for the roots. I'm growing these crops and using this type of system kind of as a model system for potential growth on another planet um, for as in a Martian base or a lunar base. And this particular system, a hydroponic system with a nutrient solution coming from a human derived source is our model to really understand a full closed system in a sustainable way to have a base on another planet. So we work with human waste and not animal waste because we won't necessarily have animal waste on another planet or in transit to another planet on the International Space Station or another type of space station or a Mars or lunar base. So we're working with human waste because it's a way that we close the cycle. So the project that I work on, the idea is we take all of the waste products of the crew that's on the actual mission and we convert that into food, water, and oxygen. And the idea is this closed loop system that's really involving the human and what the human needs for these long-term space missions or these space bases. So the process of the urine before I receive it and use it on my plants is an extensive process that's done at the AWOG Aquatic Research Center with their spinoff company called VUNA. And the product I use is called Arin. And what they do is they collect the urine from no mixed toilets in this building and they have it stored kind of in their basement. And it stores there for a certain amount of months to help certain chemical processes to occur. To make it clear, even though we're using human waste products, it doesn't smell bad at all. When it's bottled, it just smells like whiskey. (laughs) Plants just like us need water. So over time, they suck up the water and we need to replace some of it. Um, So I will do that with, with a hose. Along with the soybean, we're also growing an alternative crop called Salicornia europina. And this is a salt tolerant crop that grows along the coasts of France and northern Belgium and even along the coasts of, of the San Francisco Bay Area. And that's a tractor passing by. 
because <laughs> we are out in the agricultural fields, so we get a little bit of everything out here. And what salicornia is, it's salt tolerant, so it likes high salt concentrations. And the human urine and the particular product that we use has higher salt concentrations. So we're interested in using this alternative crop to kind of take up that excess salt. And what's really cool about salicornia is that the ones growing in the human urine actually look like a little tiny pine forest. You can actually eat this plant. It's a plant that you can actually stir fry up and it can be part of an astronaut's diet. My love for kind of space science or space biology started when I was very young. I would say that science fiction definitely played a role. This was something that was shared amongst my father and my brother growing up, either reading some science fiction novels or really watching science fiction films. How are you feeling, Jake? Hey, guys. <laughs> Welcome to your new buddy, Jake. And I have to be honest, one of the major movies that came out that really showed me that I could do something like this was the movie Avatar. The main character, a scientist, she's a space exobiologist, and her name is Grace Augustine, Dr. Grace Augustine. And it's super nerdy, but when I saw that film, that was a big eye-opener of, wow, even though it was science fiction, but the way they made that film and the way that that science was presented and the concepts going up to having a career as an exobiologist or an astrobiologist became even more seemingly possible. And that was very much influential as well. I do sometimes talk to the plants, especially the ones that I feel are a bit sad because I can't really do anything about it. All I can do is kind of watch them suffer a bit because in the, in the type of research that we're doing, we're really trying to understand kind of really how the plant is responding to these different nutrient solutions and these different either amendments that we're adding. And so some are doing fantastic. And yes, I will encourage them a bit. And sometimes I'm listening to music down here um, while I'm working. But the others, I'm a bit, it's, it is a bit sad, but there's some, even the ones that aren't doing so well, they're showing signs of different growth patterns. So I will talk to them and be like, what, what's happening? What, what's leading you to this? And I tell them, hopefully I will figure it out. <laughs> I truly am just excited every time I walk into my glass house or I'm running an experiment. I mean, granted, it can be tedious and it can be sometimes obnoxious to always do repetitive work, but it really is a dream. For the moon, 100%. No questions asked, I would go to the moon in a heartbeat. Man, that would be the next amazing opportunity to go to the moon and work in a greenhouse. Even if it's, I mean, going to the moon is a much simpler journey, it takes about three days. So it would be amazing if we could have the technology or the ability to have visiting scientists on the moon and studying actually within that extreme environment and that extreme elements. I think that particular type of established collaboration across either international borders or just scientists worldwide would be quite an amazing thing to do. That's our first goal, to really go to the moon and, and do some practice trial runs before we head all the way to Mars. Um, but if the time was right in my life, then yes, I would go to Mars. Grace Crane, astrobiologist at ETH Zurich. Her greenhouse and office are located in Lindau Eschikon. That's about a 20-minute train ride away from the main building of ETH Zurich. 
If you like this episode of the podcast, please share it with your friends. I produced it together with Ties Wachter's Audio Story Lab and with sound designer Luki Fritz. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri.